Good evening. Welcome to tonight's virtual program. Uh, where we'll be discussing breaking the truth of the true impact of the atomic bomb. Uh, we are um, immensely honored to host tonight's uh, speakers, uh, Leslie M.M. Bloom, who is the author of the new book, Fallout, uh, who will be joined in conversation by writer Adam Gottman. Uh, my name is Bo Mendez. I am the manager of programs and digital communications here at Brooklyn Historical Society. And while we wish that we could welcome you to our physical locations, I am still honored and have the privilege to welcome you all to our virtual programs, which we've been able to shift to. We've been uh, lucky to do so. And we look forward to uh, hopefully having you join us for more in the coming uh, weeks. Um, before we get to the subject of tonight's program, I just want to share a little bit about some things that we have uh, coming up, things to look forward to, uh, more virtual programs that hopefully you might be interested in joining us for. Um, we will be hosting, next week, we'll be hosting uh, Zephyr Teachout, uh, anti-corruption expert and former New York State Attorney General uh, candidate, who will be sharing her new book, Break Em Up, in a conversation with Rohit Chopra. Uh, they will be exploring the, the, the connections between big money and its impact on our democracy. That will be on August 11th. Um, the following week, we will be hosting Rick Perlstein in a conversation with Jeffrey Tubin discussing, uh, discussing Rick Perlstein's new book, Reagan Link, which continues uh, an, an exploration we've been doing of the recent history of the Republican Party and modern American conservatism. Uh, that will be on August 19th. Uh, we are also proud to partner with the Ms. Foundation on an upcoming series entitled Women in Power, 100 Years After the 19th Amendment, uh, which will be kicking off on August 18th, the 100-year anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, with a discussion of body power. We'll be welcoming um, Tressie McMillan Cotton, Jennifer Finney Boylan, and moderator Raquel Willis to discuss uh, issues pertaining to the bodies of women throughout time and how they continue to be sites of contention and often oppression. Um, we look forward to hosting many more virtual programs as they come together. You can learn more about the offerings uh, that we'll have for you at our website, brokenhistory.org. Uh, in just a moment, I'll be welcoming tonight's speakers to the virtual space. Um, this is a, a powerful conversation that we're looking forward to tonight. Of course, Tomorrow is the 75th anniversary of the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And the 9th is the uh, 75th anniversary of the same thing happening in Nagasaki. Um, these are events that shaped much of the 20th century. And while we were discussing the events themselves and their immediate impact, we're also talking about the role of journalism in sharing the story with people so we could truly understand the the uh, potential of atomic warfare, the, the human cost and the danger that it posed. Um, reflecting today on the recent passing of the legendary journalist Pete Hamill, who we also had the pleasure of hosting uh, a few years ago, I want to share a quote of his that it, the, it's the work of a journalist to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Uh, so today in um, our landscape of fake news, such a narrative of the potential danger of misinformation and propaganda and how reportage and journalism can help us cut through to see the truth is something that uh, rings all the more important. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, tonight's speakers. Um, we are very honored and glad to have them joining us tonight. Um, tonight we'll be joined by Leslie M.M. Bloom, uh, who of course is the author of Fallout. Uh, she is an award-winning journalist, historian, and New York Times best-selling author. Her work has appeared in Vanity Fair, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, um, The Wall Street Journal Magazine, The Los Angeles Review of Books, The Paris Review Daily, Vogue, T, The New York Times Style Magazine, The Hollywood Reporter, Slate, The Parkers, and many, many more. Uh, she will be joined in conversation by Adam Gopnik, who has been writing for The New Yorker since 1986. During his more than 30 years at the magazine, he has written hundreds of essays from personal memoirs to reviews and profiles, along with much reporting from abroad, along with fiction, humor, and art criticism. Um, as the conversation unfolds, I want to remind you that um, we will be taking questions. If you have any questions for our speakers, you can submit them via the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. And again, uh, the subject of tonight's discussion is, of course, Leslie's book, Fallout, uh, we have uh, teamed with our friends at Community Bookstore uh, based here in Brooklyn. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the book and possibly purchase your copy, you can do so via the link that is in the chat now. 
And without further ado, uh, please welcome Leslie and Adam. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Great. Thank you both for being here. Looking forward to this conversation. And uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you for hosting. And Adam, thank you for doing this. Delighted to do it, Leslie. First of all, congratulations on this extraordinary book. I will hold up the, uh, the hardcover. You mean my second, my second born? Uh, the Hiroshima cover up. And by the way, should it be Hiroshima or, or Hiroshima? You know, I, I mix them up and I shouldn't because it should be Hiroshima. But if I lapse into my bad ways, a, please forgive me. There's a n lovely small moment in the book where Harold Ross, the editor of The New Yorker, says, <laughs> not only am I publishing this damn thing, I've learned a new way I have to pronounce it. And I assumed he meant Hiroshima, that Hersey had explained him. You got to say Hiroshima, not Hiroshima. Um, and it's an extraordinary book. Uh, it's about both um, a uh, epoch marking and a uh, catastrophic event, but even more and more importantly about the coverage of that event and how it was turned yeah. into words. You call it um, the Hiroshima cover-up. Um, I have a, as you know, Leslie, a very particular and I'm afraid very parochial interest in this book because it's very much about the history of the New Yorker and the wow. evolution and development of the New Yorker. But before we get to the New Yorker and how the internal, uh, uh, dynamics of the New Yorker shaped this book in many ways. Um, what do you mean by the, the cover-up? What was the state of play when John Hersey went off to Japan to do the reporting that produced his legendary piece, Hiroshima, which filled an entire issue of the New Yorker, the first time that it ever happened, um, a year after the bombing? Well, I mean, honestly, look, and you know, the audience should know that you were, you know, a, a sounding board for me since the very beginning. And, and when I first started researching this project, I didn't actually realize the extent to which a cover up was even going to play a role in this in this narrative at all. I just really wanted to know the backstory. You know, I always approach the story as a journalist covering another journalist. And the story of, of Hersey's Hiroshima has always been about its outsized success but nobody ever looked at how the hell he got the story in the first place. And so when you've been along, I mean, I started my career in Nightline's newsroom as a production coordinator. They make you do that so you learn how the story comes down entirely to logistics and you know, whoever controls the ground controls the story. So I wanted to look at the logistics of how we got in. So when I started looking at how much General MacArthur and his occupation forces had you know, total domination of Japan at the time, I started to realize how, um, how impossible it would have been for Hersey to get in, you know, as an independent reporter, as opposed to, to getting in with their help. And the more that, you know, I researched the subject, um, I really started to come across um, in, in historical accounts of MacArthur's um, administration, how much he had suppressed the foreign press and the Japanese press in particular, and the, the magnitude of the cover up. Um, it's been addressed uh, previously by, by scholars, but never to the extent that I felt that it, it should have been, and it ended up being you know, extremely central to the story, because John well, Hersey they, was the one who effectively exposed it. What, what were they covering up, Leslie, in, in, a, in a sentence or two? Well, I mean, interestingly, you know, they, the government and President Truman in particular seemed to be almost ecstatically advertising the might of the bomb when they announced that they had dropped this, you know, mega experimental weapon on Hiroshima. You know, it was equivalent to 20,000 tons of TNT. Um, it was the biggest bomb that had ever been used in the history of warfare. You know, the government uh, released pictures of the mushroom cloud. They released pictures of the landscape devastation. But what Hersey and his editors were quick to pick up on was there was weirdly no reporting on the human toll of, you know, nobody knew what was happening, you know, to the human beings who had been among the only humans in history and the receiving end of nuclear attack. Still are to, the, and blessedly still are to this day. Um, let, let's move, if, if I, then that was the, the environment in which Hersey began reporting this piece. Let's talk a little bit about the New Yorker in 1945 and 1944. Yes, please. And where, and where it was. Um, as we've as we've discussed many times, of course, the, um, uh, the New Yorker was in transition at that moment when, when Hersey began re the reporting for, for this piece. Um, it had changed in the course of four years from 1941, from the onset of the war from Pearl Harbor till the end of the war, uh, more dramatically than perhaps it ever changed in its now 90 year history, because as you write um, and evoke beautifully, um, 
it had been still essentially, not entirely, but essentially a humor and local reporting magazine, um, noted for its fiction, noted for its elegant and stylish reporting, but still very much in the initial imprint of Harold Ross's inspiration. Then the war broke out, um, and one editor in particular, I think, um, played an outsized role in making the magazine take on a much more ambitious and almost magisterial role in its reporting. And that was, am I right, William Sean? Oh yeah, absolutely. But I mean, both of the, both William Sean and Harold Ross, I mean, these, these were newsmen in disguise in a way, you know, and even though the magazine had been started, as you say, you know, 20 years earlier, you know, as a sophisticated niche humor magazine and, you know, Harold Ross never at that point had any aspirations for the magazine to be a big news operation. You know, we parallel the news, we don't report the news. Um, but he had been a newsman, and you know, before that, and so had William Sean. And you know, as you say, once Pearl Harbor happened, that was it. The magazine went to a wartime footing right away. And you know, Harold Ross, you know, bemoaned to one of his his co-editors, you know, it couldn't be a humor magazine anymore because quote nothing feels funny anymore. Okay. Um, and yeah. so, you know, and and many of the writers who were already on hand went off to war and really found themselves as writers and as artists. I think about A.J. Liebling, above all, who was a, a local feature writer who mm -hmm. then went off um, and became A.J. Liebling, went off to report the, uh, the war in North Africa, eventually the, mm -hmm. the Normandy invasion and the rest of it. And there was a whole generation who made that trip. Was it not? Was there not? Yeah, I mean, they, they dispatched correspondents all over the world in London and Paris. I mean, many theaters of, um, you know, of, of war and, you know, they had a pretty deep relationship with the War Department and their, their PR, PR, their public relations operation. Um, Sinclair and, McElway, Sinclair McElway, who's an, a, oh, yeah. an apology of his work I once uh, uh, edited, was actually working for Curtis LeMay in, the, in PR throughout the whole war, though he was a linchpin of the New Yorker's operation. Well, there was a, a lot of overlap like that. I mean, a lot of, you know, well, not a lot, I mean, but a handful of the, the correspondents and the artists, you know, were in the armed forces also were acting, you know, for the armed forces. And, you know, just, you know, the New Yorker ran a ton of profiles on, on military. Sometimes the editors even commissioned um, stories from military um, uh, military figures, you know, sometimes even a public relations man here or two, maybe just to keep things cozy with the War Department. Right. right. But you know, for the, for the most part, I mean, the the war reporting it was serious. I mean, they were, you know, David to to the New York Times and Goliath, but they but they were in, they were in the mix, um, you know, very much so. And you know, I always loved the description of you know William Sean as the quote unquote hunch man, you know, where he would just send one of his correspondents into the field, and he didn't know what the scoop was going to be. He just knew that there would be one. And that would, you know, to play an important role. He trusted, role. His, he trusted his writers. He believed in his writers. Mm -hmm. And that leads us, so, so why John Hersey, Leslie? Why, um, Hersey was actually sort of not um, uh, bred and bo born and bred as a New Yorker. He came from the loose uh, organization in lots of ways. What made Hersey, what made Sean trust that Hersey could get this hardest of all hard stories? Well, I mean, Hersey couldn't have been less from the New Yorker stable, right? I mean, he's writing for Time magazine and, you know, Henry Lewis, who was the head of Time Inc. and Harold Ross, the head of the New Yorker, hated each other, like, you know, voluptuously, hilariously, publicly hated each other. Um, you know, and Hersey had been reporting for Time um, since 1939. Uh, and Luce was even at one, you know, one point really grooming him to be the heir apparent to, uh, to, to Time Inc. Um, you know, unfortunately, he had a very time, not just to interrupt. He had a very timing vibe, as, as the kids would say now. He was uh, of of that of that type. He was not a fat New York Jew like A.J. Liebling. He was an <laughs> elegant, elegant patrician figure. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, super patrician. I mean, and he was also, you know, fr from Yale School, you know, uh, across the uh, school. What is skull it? Bone. Skull, skull and bones. Skull and bones. Oh, right. Sorry, um, you know, and, and Hotchkiss and, um, you know, I mean, he, right, right. And, and, and also, you know, when you read the, the, the time and the, the life dispatches that Hersey wrote, I mean, they are a far cry from what he was writing for, um, for the New Yorker later on. I mean, I folk huge, as somebody who cares only about literary style, I think that's a hugely important point. <laughs> I want to hold it for a moment because I think it's. You run with it. You run with it because you, you, you know, mean. You what he did. But. He had written one sig hugely significant piece in, in historical terms, an incredibly significant piece for the New Yorker before that, set in the Pacific, right? 
Um, well, I, I'm going to tee it. I'm going to bat it back to you in a second after I tee it up. But so that's how Hersey did come to, you know, come to the New Yorker. So he, he actually, um, he breaks up with Luce because, you know, Luce is far too um, chauvinistic, uh, you know, patriotically chauvinistic um, for him. And he, um, he says, thanks, but no thanks. And he's, instead of being heir apparent to, you know, this Make, you know this this burgeoning media empire. He's a freelancer in nineteen you know nineteen forty five. But um, you know in nineteen forty four he had managed somehow um, to do a story that William Sean you know William Sean at the New Yorker had really wanted to bring Hersey in and Hersey um, had a story that Life had rejected and then he brought it to Sean and Sean said come come this way um, and it was the story of um, the of John F Kennedy. In, in the Pacific, um, PT PT 109. And right. so um, Hersey's wife had been the former paramour of JFK. JFK had been- a large class. This was a significant class of people, right? Who had been paramour. They, they, all, they all knew each other. They, were, they all slept with each other. I mean, and you know, so Hersey's on his way back from the Pacific and he, I'm sorry, erase that. JFK was on his way back from the Pacific. He's in New York. And one night he's at a nightclub. Some people say it's the Martinique Club. Other biographers say it's the Stork Club. And he runs into Hersey and his wife. And you know JFK is telling Hersey the story of what had happened. Um, you know J JFK had been um, you know the head of his PT boat, which was sliced in half by a Japanese um, a destroyer. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, Hersey is like. I want that story. I mean, he said, he always said it was significant, not just because he was Joseph Kennedy's son, but because it was just a hell of a story in its own right. So life rejects it. He brings it to the New Yorker and, you know, William Sean is, you know, excited to have it at last. So in many ways, you know, that, that story um, helped make Kennedy's political career and that it got trotted out by Joseph Kennedy and by Kennedy's campaign teams for every political campaign that he had, but it also helped make John Hersey's career because it, it provided his in route to the magazine that would make him famous because he knew he was going nowhere fast at time. And, and you mentioned too that um, old Joe Kennedy hated the fact that it had appeared in the New Yorker. That was like, that was not a big enough magazine for his- Oh yeah, no, he was not as hell. Like li life would have been great, but you know, the New Yorker was, you know, just like this pigeony little pie for him. Um, and so he even, you know, badgered um, Harold Ross into, you know, having it syndicated in, I think, Reader's Digest, and, you know, which was another magazine that Harold Ross despised. Um, and it's still, uh, it, he, it, he it, I don't know how Kennedy twisted his arm, but it did syndicate in Reader's Digest. So Joe Kennedy got, you know, his, his mass publication of that story after all for his son. Speaking of Reader's Digest, just a quick um, uh, footnote to this too. Another thing about the New Yorker in those war years, of course, is, was that the so-called Pony edition, that mm -hmm. it was appeared in a smaller edition, which was available to the service, but it was a key yeah. thing in driving up its circulation and making yeah. it more important for all the guys who were coming home who would buy it in 1946. Um, when it came out. So Hersey has this relationship with Sean based yep. bizarrely, incredibly, on the PT-109 piece. And then what happens? So how does he get to Japan? Uh, and how does he break through the walls of uh, uh, the cover-up? Well, I mean, you know, like I said, I had assumed one should never assume. It's the, the first lesson of, you know, not just journalism, but life. But, it, you know, it, the- The, the line in the Tracy and Hepburn movie too. Remember in the desk set. She says, never assume. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did. I was, I was, I was, you know, initially a very bad journalist. I chastised myself publicly, you know, for that right now. Um, but, you know, it, because the Hiroshima, Hersey's Hiroshima does have the story, it has all the, the, the feeling of an expose, right? So I had assumed that it was, you know, him getting in and getting out somehow as a unilateral because other reporters had made a run at the story that way. And they went to like crazy lengths to subterfuge their ways into Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, so Hersey's in, he's in New York um, in, in August, 1945, when the bomb uh, explodes and he, he hears about it. Um, he's has mixed feelings about Hiroshima, mostly horrified, but thinks it's going to end the war. Nagasaki, he thinks it's a totally criminal action. And he doesn't, he, he knows he's going to cover the bombs in some capacity, but he doesn't know exactly how just yet. Then he has lunch with William Sean and they talk about the coverage and they realize that, you know, what has been missing again is, is you know, stories about the human tolls. What happened to the human beings under those roiling mushroom crowd, clouds? Um, you know, nobody was reporting on that. And, you know, it's, it's likely that they knew the extent 
or, or some of the extent of the restrictions that were being placed on both foreign and Japanese reporters by MacArthur's forces in Tokyo because the journalism community was very close knit back then. Um, a lot of Hersey's former uh, wartime friends and colleagues were part of the occupation press corps. So they, they probably knew that right. the only way in wasn't, he wasn't gonna you know, paddle a boat from Guam into Japan. He was gonna have to get you know, military clearance to get in. So he starts his, um, he decides he's going to do a major reporting trip that starts first in China, which is the country he was born in, and then apply for clearance. He's going to be accredited in, in China and then, you know, having reestablished himself with the military there, apply for clearance to get into Tokyo. Um, and it, it works. He, he gets cleared. He's, um, and there's, there's, there's right. for that. but you know, one of the things that interested me reading your wonderful book list, like is the, um, the reporters in this period both have, in a certain sense, less freedom because people, everyone expects you to conform to the needs of the military. There's a kind of patriotic reflex that is easy to evoke. But at the same time, uh, more because the whole business of post-Vietnam, of the military wanting to keep reporters as far away as humanly possible wasn't in place yet. They expected to be traveling with guys who would be writing. Yeah, I mean, it was a buddy system throughout the war, you know, and, and that's one of the things that gave Hersey this huge, this huge advantage when it came to getting cleared to get in because Hersey had been, you know, quite a buddy to the military during, during the war. I mean, he had um, uh, written glowing profiles of many military figures, including, you know, JFK. Um, he had, he was a commended war hero. I mean, he you know, helped evacuate wounded Marines in the Solomon Islands while he was covering um, a, a story, I'm uh, sorry, covering a battle between um, U.S. and Japanese forces. Um, most significantly, perhaps, he had written a, a really glowing biography of General D uh, Douglas MacArthur and his forces, um, you know, which he later thought was so laudatory that he wanted to take it out of circulation. But I mean, that definitely helped the cause, you know, when you're okay. applying to, to General MacArthur, you know, to come into the country. So, you know, even though Hiroshima and Nagasaki were restricted topics, um, and they were really vetting journalists coming and going um, into Japan. I mean, Hersey would may have seen as been seen as a relatively innocuous, um, reliable, reliable yeah. man. Exactly, a company man still. Um, so then he he gets from China. He gets to Japan, and when he gets to Hiroshima, finally, mm -hmm. and tell us about how how he does that. The extraordinary step forward is, is that he talks to people rather than reporting on events. How does he begin to find the people who will form the spine of the, um, of the great piece he writes? Well, I mean, that was a really, you're, as you say, that was an incredibly important departure. For, and it's, it might seem obvious now, you know, if he, to, to just focus on a few individuals to bring out the human element of the story, but it was pretty revolutionary then. I mean, and especially because he was, what he was proposing to do was to humanize Japanese victims and the Japanese, you know, were enemy number two after the Nazis, if not one, because they had attacked us directly, right? Um, so when Hersey um, eventually is admitted to Tokyo, and by the way, he does not have free reign there just because he, you know, he's, been the company man. He's not only being monitored by SCAP, which is um, uh, MacArthur's uh, operation there. Uh, the FBI knows that he's on the ground. They notify FBI DC. Um, you know, I mean, they're, 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 they're you know, surveying. They, him, right? Yeah, they're surveying. But I mean, at, at the same time, it's, you know, you don't want to read too much into it. They surveyed everybody. They knew, you know, what you ate, what you thought, how many cigarettes you smoked every day. Um, but they gave Hersey um, clearance to go to Hiroshima for two weeks, which might sound pretty substantial, but it includes travel that would have been, you know, 24 to 36 hours of travel to get there in, this, in, in, in that time. Um, and when he gets there, he uh, has the help of a German priest who had been uh, living there and had returned, who spoke English. And um, through this German priest uh, and uh, one other Japanese minister who had been educated at Emory University and therefore spoke English, these two gentlemen um, not only gave Hersey their own testimonies, but they, all, they also made enormous introductions for Hersey among the blast survivors um, who, were, who had been returning to Hiroshima to try to rebuild their lives among the ashes. And ultimately from 
he, he later on Hersey didn't remember exactly how many he had interviewed. Um, so we'll just say several dozen is probably most accurate. He would pick six. And coming back to something that, that preoccupies me, I don't think frivolously, one of the things that makes Hiroshima uh, such an important work of journalism and literature is that Hersey saw his subject in a novelistic way. And he even, as you reveal, had a very specific novelistic uh, pattern and template that he was, uh, he was applying to his material. Right. Well, I mean, it, it wasn't just enough that he was going to, you know, show it from the in, in, show the events from the individual point of view. He was he decided that he was going to it, it had to be six individuals whose lives intersected on, on right. the day, and um, and also it was you know their their lives in the moments in the lead up and exactly where they were, um, you know, at that exact at the moment of detonation and then how their paths crossed in the hours and the days of, of the aftermath, um, sometimes in pretty shocking, shocking ways. Um, and so it was basically, it was, it was like he was weaving a, a, a neighborhood, um, a neighborhood narrative in a way. And because he, the people who he picked ultimately at a profile, whose testimonies he picked a profile, were regular folks, what he was doing is he was creating empathy for them because, you know, as American readers, you know, not, not all of them were gonna be able to fathom the physics of how the bomb worked or be able to fathom what all out nuclear war looks like, but they would be able to relate to the stories of, let's say a young mother with three young school age kids or a young clerk or a young doctor, you know, who are going about their business, feeding their families, you know, getting on the bus to work, um, you know, at the moment catastrophe strikes. Right, but I was thinking specifically though, that um, as you mentioned, that the, the Thornton Wilders novel, Bridge of yeah. San Luis Rey, clearly was a kind of, gave him a kind of organizing principle where the story of how six uh, people, strangers to themselves, are share a moment of common disaster. And, yeah, and that's sort of theoretical. I mean, he, he very, he literally did have that as his inspiration. Yeah. He read it, you know, in sick bay. Um, right. And while he was covering in China, some, he had been, gotten some horrible flu. He was laid up in a, laid up in a- um, China a, flu, a China flu, Leslie. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> the precursor of China Fu. But he read Wilder's great novel uh, yeah. while he was recovering in China and kept yeah. it in his head and said, yeah. and, and saw when he began to try, as we all do when we're reporting something with any kind of ambition, uh, saw, oh, that's the way I can tell this story of these intersecting lives. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it gave it a, a really cohesive structure to tell it. And, you know, he knew he wanted it to be novelistic. And, and you know, because look, let's face facts, people had real incentive not to read this work. I mean, it was going to be graphic. It was going to confront people with the fact that they had had what one person called a 4th of July attitude about the bombings. It was going to be embarrassing to the government. I mean, everybody had every incentive to, you know, hot potato it out of their hands, right? But, you know, if he could make it novelistic enough and enthralling enough for people not to put it down, then he, it was it was almost like a uh, he was a Trojan horse reporter getting into Japan, and this was a way to Trojan horse the the material into people's into people's homes and 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 lives and make them willing to read it. Coming back one step, then Leslie, um, what did if anything, and you talk about it here, what did the occupying force, the M MacArthur's army, think he was going to be doing in in Hir Hiroshima, basically doing a kind of follow up piece about the after effects of the bombing? Well, I mean, they knew he was going down there and, you know, there's evidence that um, he, he stayed with military police while he was in Hiroshima and there's evidence that, you know, they knew that he was out and about and talking to people. But by that point, they had started letting other reporters in who um, were, were not reporting on the aftermath of Hiroshima anymore. It was considered an old story by that point. And so, you know, a lot of, you know, when reporters were admitted, um, they were really ostensibly there to do these kind of more fluffy stories, if you can believe that, on they the- about Hiro Hiroshima, it's a year old, go in and do a fluff, a right, fluff piece. Right. Right. The, the, like, you know, tell us, tell us what the gardens of Hiroshima look like. So it was like, you know, this is Hiroshima coming back and, you know, people are back and they're not just rebuilding- That's what I had in mind, is that buildings. if the military had something in mind, it was, oh, Hiroshima is coming back, being, having an atomic bomb dropped on it was- Nothing was, to see here, it wasn't so bad. Right, exactly. That was the story that they, that they imagined. I would think, you know, you and I have both reported things, you more ambitiously than me, me on a, on a more uh, provincial New York scale. 
but it's very hard when you are reporting something not to be altered by the people you meet. What was, do we know, Hersey's state of mind as these stories, which are still uh, shrivel the heart to read of people uh, losing, not only losing family, but losing their entire existence of this moment of existential disbelief. How did it affect Hersey psychologically as he was in the midst of reporting that story? Well, I mean, we have to remember he's a hardened war correspondent. I mean, I, I don't mean, you know, like, you know, hard, I mean, some bitter or, or callous or anything like that, but he's, you know, he's been around. In the field for three years, right. Yeah, I mean, he, he reported in Europe. I mean, he's, he'd seen, let's just say he'd seen everything in his war reporting from combat to concentration camps. And, you know, he had seen Tokyo raised. I mean, somebody described, one of his uh, contemporary reporters described Tokyo as looking like an ashtray with just cigarette butts sticking out of it. You know, so, I mean, his frame of reference was, you know, let's just say he was, he was tough minded, but when he got to Hiroshima, he was horrified by what he had seen, not because he wasn't used to seeing devastation and, you know, let's face it, the worst of human nature uh, in, in healthy doses or unhealthy doses rather, um, but because it was a single bomb that had done this. I mean, Hiroshima was leveled. And I mean, I, I don't want to be graphic in this um, broadcast, but I mean, you know, some, I mean, the, I mean, some of the, they're still finding remains in Hiroshima today. They were flattened graveyards. Um, so when he, get, when he got there, he was so disturbed by what he was finding there that, um, and e even, even seeing, you know, the fluff stories weren't entirely wrong. I mean, there was, you know, a regrowth of, of um, flora, but I mean, it, it was, things had been unnaturally stimulated to grow back. And so, I mean, everything about it was horrible and unnatural. And so he vowed that he was going to, to try to get the recording done as quickly as he could and then get the hell out of there because it was so traumatizing for him. Right, and, and, and did. Where did he actually do his writing? Well, he very smartly, well, he and William Sean decided that, that he was going to do his reporting and bring it back to, to New York because, you know, even though, you know, wartime censorship had ended in the States and in the fall of 1945, Japan and um, America were still officially at war when it was in the occupation. So censorship, you know, still um, happened. Um, and so he, he got out of Hiroshima, he came back to New York and he this wrote- the This is the kind of detail that, that only writers relish, but I, but I do. He had his notebooks from the interviews. Well, so, okay, so I, that was another thing that I was really interested in is, you know, how did, how did Hersey take his, his notes? I mean, I, I mean, we knew that his, his um, protagonists later recalled that he had taken notes um, in little notebooks. His notebooks do not exist in his, in his files, but they remember right. that. Right. Right. Um, and also, I, I mean, my question, which it was unanswered, is did he did he do them in shorthand? Because he learned shorthand um, from Sinclair Lewis, who he had been um, an assistant to beforehand. So it's possible that he did it that way because all of his protagonists, when they read the read the account later on, remarked at the extreme accuracy of his memory. And you know, it, it must to take notes like that in real time. Um, you, you have to have some kind of a system to, to be able to get everything. So unfortunately, the, the no, I, I don't know what happened to the notebooks. I would give anything to know what happened to the notebooks, but um, it, he, he did make it from point A to point B with material to enough to create um, an accurate, accurate right. account. It's also, it's, it's mind-boggling, of course, it's also a period before there's any recording, any, uh, any oh, yeah, real there, tape recording. Yeah. Yeah, there was there was no there no no voice recordings no apparatus nothing like that. I, I've known one reporter, great reporter, Alec Wilkinson, who taught himself shorthand with that very idea in mind that he'd be able to uh, 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 to do it. Um, so he cuts back to New York City, and he starts the process of writing. And they know at this point, or Sean knows and Ross knows, that they want the piece in what would seem to us, given the scale of the ambition in very short order. Well, yeah, I mean, if originally there's the anniversary peg, um, it would be the first anniversary of the of the bombing. And oh, and this, I guess it's important then to mention that, you know, Hersey was there in May and early June. And so they would really only have a couple, you know, have eight weeks to, to turn it over. Um, and so it's, a, it's I, don't, I don't think that they all knew how huge the story was going to be when you started writing it in terms of length. But of course, it ends up being this 30, 31,000 right. monster. Um, 
and but he does. I mean, Hersey said that you know when he needed to, he would write in a in a, anybody called a white heat. Um, and his, um, you know, his, some of his previous books have been written that way. I mean, he was used to writing under like a wartime pressure of a of a deadline. But this one wasn't just that. He wasn't just meeting the anniversary peg. He's doing it under enormous pressure too, because he knows what he's writing is gonna is gonna you know really embarrass the U.S. government and show the truth about their experimental mega weapons. And then. And so he produces this and then um, and submits it to William Sean. And then Sean persuades uh, Harold Ross to do something that was very ballsy and uh, un unparalleled in its ambition. And that's to make it an entire issue of The New Yorker. Yeah, which is, you know, was what one uh, former New Yorker editor called an unprecedented splurge. Yes. you know, back then, and, you know, Harold Ross is like, are you, are you crazy? I mean, they, it, it's a year later, they had just gotten back to a post-war footing. Um, you know, there, there's a sense of normalcy coming back into the magazine, cartoons. People want to see the cartoons, they want to read the talk of the town. It's part of the continuity of their lives to have that. And, Ro and Sean knew that we had to disrupt that continuity. Well, right. I mean, that's, that's the question that, you know, it, again, it, it presents them with an, a, you know, a really central question, you know, what is the purpose of this magazine? You know, does it continue its wartime purpose of, of you know, fearless reporting or does it revert entirely to something that's, you, you, know, you tell us something that I thought was unforgettable, which is, is that the way Harold Ross finally persuaded himself to do what William Sean, whom he admired and trusted, was pressing him to do, was not to think about the future of the magazine, but to think about the magazine's um, past, to think about its very DNA. Yeah, so, well, he went back and he looked at his original statement that he had published in, what, it was 1925, isn't that the, the law? And then also the prospectus that he um, had created in 1924 when he was trying to convince backers to back the New Yorker. Um, and, you know, one of the sentences that he had written himself, and it probably in a moment of um, gravitas, you know, was that the, the magazine was always to have, you know, a serious purpose, um, despite the the... the, the uh, the frivolity, uh, the, the more um, the, the nature of levity um, that the magazine had, and that it was going to report without fear, without favor, which is a really important line. And um, so Harold Ross draws inspiration from himself. And, yes. you know, he, he comes back and he says to Sean, you know, I'll give you the green light. Um, but, you know, they're, they're, you know they're, they're not, William Sean is really the driver on this whole story and, 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 you know, in terms of having sent Hersey in the first place, you know, championed it to run at full length, championed it to run in a single issue instead of four installments because people would have lost interest. It wouldn't have had its impact. And then it would have lost its essential form because the essential form was the intersection of those stories, not just having them chronologically one after another. Exactly. And so the cliffhangers in the story as, inter as Hersey interweaves those stories, it only works if it's one long, one long piece. Right. Um, and so, so Ross is, is convinced to do it. And I mean, it's a hell of a gamble because not only are they about to drop this on their, their readers who have no idea that it's coming and, you know, they're, let's face it, they're, they're in peacetime mode at this point. Like they're not expecting a huge wartime atrocity story. They're, you know, expecting, um, they're, they're in a moment of, of recovery, of, you know, regaining, again, this feeling of, of normalcy or what, Al, you know, Albert Einstein would say, escaping into easy pleasures without having, you know, confronted the past. Well, they were about to be confronted with the past. Again, because I think it's so vital to everything that, that this story is about, you know, the division between reporting, fact reporting in some, in a kind of a robotic journalistic form and writing in a, in, in a, with great attention to structure and sentences is a, it's a false division. And I think Hersey's work demonstrates that. One of the very good points you make is that Hersey had written about the bomb before. Time Life wrote a lot about the bomb, but it was always in terms of these enormous oraton generalizations about the fate of man and the destiny of the atom and the, the promise of science and the damnation yeah, the of science. That was pseudo-biblical language, yeah. Exactly. It all existed at this um, impossibly high uh, level of rhetorical abstraction. And yes. the key to what Hersey was doing is that there's absolutely no rhetorical abstraction in it anywhere. Oh, yeah, no, no. He, they boiled it down. Well, I mean, again, when we were talking about him writing for time, I mean, his time writing was, you know, pretty pronouncy, pretty styly. It had, it had a little swagger, you know, to it. This was, you know, stripped down. And... Um, 
you know, Hersey said he didn't want to evince any outrage. It was just entirely about, you know, laying out the facts, letting, you know, the people who he had, who had given them, him, their testimonies to speak in their own words and to just let the story unravel in that way. And he felt that the less that the story smacked of outrage, the, the higher, um, you know, the, the, the more effective it was going to be. And um, I mean, and, and it really, it really worked, you know, because by dialing it down from this God's eye point of view down to the human vantage, human vantage point, it allowed people to really put themselves into the shoes of, of the people who he, in this very spare sort of way, their, whose experiences he was recounting. So the piece comes out, Sean persuades Ross, Ross persuades himself through Ross <laughs> through this piece. Uh, Hersey writes it on, to a, at a speed that's uh, still astounding considering the exquisite quality of the, uh, of the writing and the, and the testimony. It comes out and what happens? Well, Hersey uses the word explosive to describe the reaction. That's not a word I use in my book for obvious right. reasons. You know, one always has to avoid the explosive metaphor. But I mean, it is, you know, the sentiment is accurate and it created an international furor. I mean, um, you know, it's funny that, you there's, know, the first there's nothing on the cover of the issue that indicates the contents of the issue. No, which is, it was a, a fascinating decision. And so, you know, New York, you know better than I do. I mean, look, New Yorker covers are decided or at least then they were decided weeks in advance. Months, months in advance, actually, at that point, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this one, uh, this the cover that had been slated for the August 31st issue was this um, sort of really dreamy park landscape, a summer park, and people were horseback riding and playing tennis and lying dreamily by streams. And, uh, you know, the New Yorker then had no writing on, on the cover to, or even a table of contents. Um, to indicate what the contents of the magazine were. And so the editors decided to keep this cover on there. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're never to the, I mean, I, I couldn't find anything from Sean or Ross on the record about why they had decided to keep it, but one could speculate, you know, that, I mean, it really does um, symbolize a sleepwalking America, you know, who was back at leisure again after war. Um, you know, a more gruesome interpretation of that is that it looks um, a lot like um, a park that is described in Hiroshima, um, you know, where people are enjoying themselves and then it later becomes a refuge for many of the, of the blast survivors in their dying hours. It, it, curiously, you know, David Remnick made the same decision to take out all of the cartoons and the talk section uh, the week after 9-11, but that was in the case where uh, the uh, the cover clearly spoke to the to the event. It comes out and it sells off the newsstands, right? It becomes a it okay. There's contraband New Yorkers, right? Yeah. After that, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, which is a terrible. Habit. No, no, no. Just, just coming back to the to the main line of the of the of the story. It is a success. Both I hate to use the word commercially, but it's all anybody talks about the week it comes out. Yeah, I mean, there was one of Hersey's contemporary reporters, you know, did a report on it and they said, we guarantee you that this week, even if you don't read it, it's all you're going to be talking about. Um, and it was true. And um, I mean, it was syndicated, not just in its entirety in papers across the country, but around the world. And ABC, you know, it is read um, verbatim over four nights. I, BBC, I, I, couldn't get, I couldn't get over that. It was read verbatim. Uh, yeah, I mean, when they had they had four actors read it, um, no music, nothing like that, and the act and the identities of the actors weren't even revealed until after it had aired, so it wouldn't de detract at all from it. Um, what were and not to interrupt you, Leslie, but you know, so it's that what was it that people learned that they could not have imagined before they read it? What it's like to be a human being on the receiving end of, of nuclear attack, for God's sake. I mean, you, you learned what it was like to be a young mother with your baby in your arms when suddenly your house collapses on you and you have to dig your way out of rubble before a firestorm consumes your neighborhood. Um, again, I don't want to be you know too graphic, but you, you learn about what happens to human beings. Um, and it was, you know, I think too, if I make, because it's a point you make, people were in a certain sense accustomed. This was at the end of the most destructive war in human history, 30 million people were killed. There, Germany was in ruins still, London was in ruins. It wasn't destruction alone that was the story. It was something about the idea, wasn't it, of destruction on this scale and of this finality. It was destroying the skin on human flesh. It was imprinting shadows on walls. It was transformational 
destruction of a kind that no one had ever imagined before and no one had understood until Hersey wrote it down. Well, it was truly apocalyptic. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the, the journalists and editors rightly after Hiroshima um, was bombed rec and quickly recognized that it was the story, not just of the war, but of modern times, because humanity had finally, after, you know, many centuries of contriving the worst possible methods of warfare, had finally invented the means to eviscerate themselves in the most gruesome way possible. And some of the scenes in Hersey's book, I mean, when you've read it, if you read it when you're 15, you remember it when you're 75. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's really, you know, completely horrific. And, and it were just, it's a great and ghoulish reminder that, you know, war is, it happens to individuals. The casualty statistics are composed of individuals who have, you know, skin that, you know, can be slipped off if you're exposed too much to the bomb. Um, so. Um, Leslie, someone's asking, and it's a good question too. Was um, Hersey concerned about nuclear contamination? Was concerned about fallout? a year later and was there any risk of that when he was um, reporting obviously in Hiroshima it, it, it's unclear if he was worried about worried about it although other people were and you know the interestingly when um, you know after after Hiroshima happened uh, General Leslie Groves and Oppenheimer led a press junket down in New Mexico at the Trinity testing site to show how you know they brought a bunch of reporters to show how little radiation there still was and you know Groves said you know something like oh in Japan you could live there forever the fact is is that um, Trinity site was probably far more contaminated than Hiroshima and Nagasaki were um, a year later because of the point of detonation of, of the bombs. I mean, the, the Trinity test, the bombing had been on the ground and the ground was contaminated. Um, in Hiroshima, it's generally said that a lot of the um, radiation was absorbed back up into the atmosphere. But that said, there uh, has been reports that uh, when the US occupation forces came into Hiroshima, they did rope off um, areas around the hypocenter for fear of possible residual radiation because the fact is they, did, they didn't totally understand oh, what right. that they had created at that point. Um, Another thing that uh, strikes me as extraordinary in all the years since, the decades since Hiroshima was published, no one has ever really challenged uh, any of its testimony or of its, of its factual uh, basis, have they? It's, it's well, true. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, that was another thing that I was, you know, interested in probing when I was doing the research of did anybody ever try to discredit Hersey or to discredit the testimonies, because obviously, again, they were really embarrassing for the U.S., um, and, you know, like even when, you know, Truman Capote did In Cold Blood, you know, legions of reporters went and tried to um, uh, cover his yeah, story. Yeah, yeah they, they were on the ground fact checking him. But, you know, several things. I mean, first of all, um, you know, the occupation lasted for several more years after um, Percy was on the ground. And it really wasn't easy to get in to interview these uh, protagonists and, and check, you know, what their feelings were about the accuracy of their stories. Um, but then after occupation lifted, they were international figures. I mean, every every year at um, on the anniversary of the bombings, reporters would contact um, Hersey's six protagonists and and ask them to comment on um, their stories. And none of them, to the best of my knowledge, um, ever came forward and said, you know, that he, they had been misquoted, um, and that nobody ever seemed to find or misquoted or had their experiences mis uh, mischaracterized. And um, again, to the best of my knowledge, no reporters ever seem to find um, inaccuracies. No, uh, it seems to be a completely impeccable piece of reporting on an incredibly difficult, um, in incredibly resistant circumstances. Well, there were, there were a few little things, um, you know, to be honest, I mean, that's just me because I started my career as a researcher, um, you know, and, and a fact checker. And um, I mean, they didn't have fact checking in the way, that, I mean, they, the way that we do today, there wasn't a way to get in and fact check every to, to go back and, and verify everything that all the reporting that he had brought home. But I mean, l little things, but you know, so for instance, you know, Reverend Tanamoto, who is one of Percy's main protagonists, you know, it, it, the book profiles him and his wife, Chisa, and their daughter, Coco Tanamoto. And, you know, Hersey characterizes her as an infant son instead of an infant girl, which she later took him to task for when she met him in person. Um, you know, and I mean, but- you can't help but something wrong, right. But I mean, just but really little things like that. And otherwise, you know, Harold Ross and, and William Sean were maniacs for, for, de uh, for granular accuracy. And so, you know, I mean, they would, you know, fight for hours over whether something would be called a doorway or a door frame. Right. So. Thanks.
something that still goes something that uh, still goes on. Um, Percy after Hiroshima, uh, his his career goes on and is very distinguished one, but he never writes anything quite on this scale or of this significance again, does he? No, I mean, well, ironically, he strips. So he always felt that he could tell stories more effectively in fiction than nonfiction. So it's ironic that he's best known for this work of, of you know, immortal nonfiction that he's done. And he, he writes many novels after Hiroshima, and a lot of them are um, interesting and, and uh, social conscience novels. And I, I have a feeling that- Very much in the tradition of Sinclair Lewis, who had been his mentor early on. Absolutely, um, but none, none of the, and I, I feel like Hersey is going to be rediscovered um, it, it just if, if for the sheer content of his interests alone, I mean, he was very interested in race relations, for instance. Um, and, you know, there was still good reporting that went into even his, his fictional works. But again, you're right. I mean, he was never as known. Whenever you see John Hersey, the, the, the headline of his obituary was, you know, John Hersey. Author the, of. of yeah. Right. Um, we, we don't have a lot of time left to us, Leslie, and this, I could go on talking to you about this subject uh, indefinitely. One of the things we were talking about um, uh, not long ago is that um, Percy got caught up at the end of his career in a, in a kind of plagiarism. Uh, it wasn't, I wouldn't call it a scandal, but a, a kerfuffle of a kind um, that I actually was witness to. I was already a young editor at the magazine when, when that took place. Um, and it was the beginning of a new kind of hyper scrutiny that was being given to journalism of all kinds, which is very much part of the moment we're living in now. You were saying to me that what part of the expectations of uh, journalism in Hersey's time was that you had a much broader license to collate, to take things from many places without uh, maniacally crediting the sources at every moment. Well, you know, when I was looking, I mean, even though Hersey's notebooks from his, his uh, interviews no longer exist, or, or no, I won't say that, they, they don't exist among his papers at, at Yale. Um, yeah, you know, in any case. Um, I mean, if they emerge, I want to be the first to get a crack at them, but, but they, they do include many of the reports that he, the scientific reports that he referred to when he was writing Hiroshima. And when my researchers and I were looking through them, once in a while, we were like, ooh, this is, you know, an awfully, we would see in a report, a, a a description like uh, that was very close to how it had ended up in Hiroshima, but you, you know it was, um, you know, like a, for instance, a report description of the geography of it, you know Hiroshima being you know fan shaped with you know seven rivers and the, but it it, it, it was inf an informational poll, and so you imagine you know this reporter who's writing on deadline who has you know a fan of of materials around him and you're just picking and picking and picking and picking. Um, you know, there was a report that he had on the effects of radiation on, you know, botanical um, growth in Hiroshima. And there's one line in the report that says, um, not only did the radiation not kill certain plants, it stimulated them. And so you see the word stimulated. He, he pulled that language for his, you know, for his own. Well, directly from the, from the report he was looking at, which seems to me completely. Uh... It's accuracy. I mean, it's meant to be accurate. Like you don't, you don't want, you're, if you're quoting a source, I mean, or if you're, you know, using the source of information, he, he pulled in additional translators when he was on the ground, especially when talking about medical terms, because he wanted absolute accuracy. And so, you know, the question of whether something like that is, you know, plagiarism when it's being pulled from a informational report that is there for the reference of the public and for experts and for journalists. I mean, it's, it's, Leslie, I, I, we don't have much time, but I want to now make a, a radical turn from process to point, I guess I, I would have to say. And this is one many people are asking about in the questions too. Um, how did Hersey feel again? It still is a question that we debate and argue about today. <laughs> did we do the necessary, if not the right thing, by dropping the bomb? Or was it uh, a war crime, an, uh, an act of evil? How did Hersey feel about that after he'd written Hiroshima? And how do you feel about it, having mm. read everything about the writing of Hiroshima? Well, again, it, you know, in the in the immediate aftermath, Hersey felt that um, Hiroshima had, you know, he had complicated feelings about it. You know, a horrible death toll is inevitable. B, um, you know, what it portended for humanity. Um, and Nagasaki, he thought it was, again, it, what he said, it was a totally criminal action. And I think later on, um, you know, he uh, thought that 
the memory of what happened Hiroshima, at Hiroshima is what had kept the world safe from subsequent use of, of nuclear weapons. weapons. Um, you know, whether that's true or not, I think we can definitely say that it has been, it's been an element, it, it has been a deterrent. So um, it's, it's actually a controversial opinion <laughs> um, that, you know, Hiroshima had, it, it didn't have to happen to prevent future Hiroshimas, but that it did, you know, help. Um, my personal feelings are that um, I still have found the, gov the then government's arguments about why they couldn't have dropped a demonstration bomb in an uninhabited area. I find them to be inadequate. Right. That was, um, oh, that was um, Oppenheimer, as you know. That was Oppenheimer's desire, or at least it was his announced desire after the fact that they should have dropped it on a, or at least on an, on an uninhabited area, shipyard or a, a, a purely uh, industrial right. zone. Well, they, I mean, they had, they had press junkets at Bikini when they were testing, you know, they could have, they could have had, you know, international press junket and, and dropped in an uninhabited area. But, uh, you know, the, one of the arguments that the government then made um, in, in a retort actually to Hersey was that, what if it had been a dud? What if they had, you know, brought, assembled the world to see the might of this thing and then it was the one that didn't work. It would have been, you know, acutely discrediting. So therefore they had to drop it on a city with a largely civilian population. I guess too, and you, you mentioned this too, that, and it's one of the reasons to be resolutely anti-war as much as we can be. The logic of warfare and the brutality of warfare made it seem, uh, if not palatable, at least then inevitable. After all, as you, as you point out, the bombing, the uh, firebombing of Tokyo, as we were talking about, was actually more destructive in terms of lives and, and land loss, property loss, than the actual bombing of Hiroshima. People get caught up in the hideous logic Mm -hmm. of destruction and it becomes an almost an impossible conveyor belt to escape from. No, I, I agree. And you know, I mean it's they're they're ghoulish in different ways. You know, I mean in, in Tokyo, it, I can't remember the exact square mileage, but enormous swath of it was destroyed in one night with a hundred thousand lives lost. And I mean it's as gruesome as what you saw in Hiroshima. But again, you know, Hiroshima was, you know, brought on by one single primitive atomic weapon. At the time, and again, what that portended for our ability to to wipe out civil is like every accomplishment, every human life, you know, in one fell swoop in the future. That's one of the things that you know that is the thing that set uh, nuclear attack apart from more conventional attack. We live under that shadow still, um, and we have lived under it, and it seems to recede and then come forward, and it never really disappears. But uh, Hersey's uh, story is um, uh, permanent. It makes me proud to have spent my adult life with the New Yorker to know that that was a, a key moment in our history. And you've written an extraordinary book about it, Leslie. I congratulate you. you. It's rare that you see a book begin as a tiny acorn of an idea that you share with friends and say, do you think there's anything in that? And then uh, become uh, 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 a major work of reporting on its own. Congratulations, Leslie. Thank you so much. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. And um, uh, thank you all for uh, being with us. Uh, yes, thank you guys so much. Thank you. And thank yes. you for the, to the Brooklyn Historical Society for hosting. Wonderful. Big thanks to the Brooklyn Historical Society. And if only we, if only we were free to be in Brooklyn right now. Bless you, Leslie. Talk again soon. <laughs>